Assalamu alaikum everyone. Today I will start with lecture number uh, 19 and I will also cover lecture number 20 in chapter number 10. I am Dr. Amna. So I will start with the chapter 10 which is about requirements. As I have already mentioned in the, my last lecture that the basics or fundamental stages of every development methodology is to establish the requirements, analyze the requirements, develop the design, implement your system, and evaluate your system. So these are the few fundamentals. So the first and most important stage of every software development life cycle is to establish the requirements. So in this chapter I will tell you that what do we mean by establishing requirements in interaction design process, how we are going to carry on with establishing the requirements and what is the value of establishing the requirements in interaction design process. So here I will first talk about the importance of requirements in interaction design. Second, I will talk about that what are the different types of requirements and how we are going to gather them. And lastly, I will tell you that how you are going to analyze these requirements. <coughs> so first of all, as I am talking about the interaction design process, this is the design process of designing user interfaces, usable interfaces, design for user experience. So I am just talking about on the layer of user interfaces. So first of all, if I talk about that, if we are talking about the requirements in interaction design, what, are, what, are, what do I mean by the requirements on uh, interaction design, how we are going to get them, and why we are going to carry on this requirement activity, why it's important. So one thing I always mention about the interaction design is that users are important. You need to understand your users as much as possible, in one, what context they are going to carry on their tasks, uh, what are their tasks, and what are the goals they want to achieve. So first of all, what I have already told you that we are going to focus on our users to understand them well. Second thing is that after understanding the users, after understanding all these stakeholders, we will be able to get these suitable requirements out of them. So uh, how we can gather the requirements? First thing I would like to tell you that we will be able to do data gathering activity like in other subjects in software engineering or inside one subject you have already studied that how you are going to gather the requirement, what are the activities involved, for example interviews, surveys, um, focus groups or direct indirect observation and things like that. Then uh, second thing is that why we have these requirements in our hands, how we will be able to uh, analyze these requirements to make them uh, in suitable form and then we will be able to really understand them as requirements that these are the user's requirements and after the analysis we can make them transfer, transferable to the design and uh, this activity will not stop here. We will do many iterations and cycles over there until unless our requirement gathering is completed. Because as we know that requirement uh, is the first stage of uh, the software development, so if we will make lot of errors while collecting our requirement, it means that we are increasing the cost of errors in the later stages. So it's better to avoid errors in this stage. So why? Understanding the right kind of requirements and why understanding or collecting the correct set of requirements is important. This figure is very good to show this or explain this. As you have seen this figure, in this figure you know that uh, in the first stage 
it's not also clear over there, but uh, while I will, I will provide you with the slides, you will be able to see it more in detail. That uh, this is the, for example, uh, there is a system uh, project manager or system analyst who went to the customer and the customer explained the um, system analyst that uh, what kind of systems do they need. So the system looked like this according to the customer requirements. While uh, the project leader, uh, okay, here it's a project leader, so customer told the project leader that how the requirements uh, look like or what they need in their system, the first picture. The second uh, picture shows that how the project leader understood that customer, uh, customer needs something like that. But while he, uh, project leader told these requirements to the system analyst, uh, he understood uh, requirements like that and he designed the requirements like that. It makes little bit sense. And then when it went to the programmer, the design of the system uh, designer or system analyst went to the programmer, when he programmed like this, okay? And uh, when it go to the business consultant, he explained the customer that their system looked like that. And in the name of documentation, there was nothing present. And when it uh, goes to deployment or installment, the operation is not like that. And when it came to the money, they cost uh, the customer money of roller coaster, you can see, very expensive. And when it comes to the maintenance or uh, operations, then there was no support available to the clients. And you know what? The actually the problem started over there, the first stage. Actually, the customer needs something like that, the last picture. And uh, even the customer did not mention his requirement clearly to the project leader, and because of that, this all problem occurred. So that's why it said that requirement gathering is extremely important phase and uh, defining it well. So you need to spend a lot of, lot of time in order to gather the requirement, in order to analyze them, and in order to re report them properly. So if I talk about the uh, term establishing requirement, what does it mean? Actually, establishing requirements cover a lot of topics. But in simple words that these are the student needs or if uh, these are the sorry, customer needs that what customer want or what users want and what the user need. So uh, in the establishing requirement phase, we definitely uh, need the requirement. We need to clarify the requirement. We need to define these requirements. We need to complete the requirements, complete the whole set of requirements for the system and re-scope it until unless they are clearly stated and mentioned for further development. So most of the time, uh, this is, you can uh, see estab establishing requirements like a phase. You have some inputs to this phase and then you have some outputs to this phase. So as an input, you have some sort of requirement documents or customer requirement in this phase, and you can consider it as a box. After uh, coming out of this box, there will be a stable set of the requirements available for further development or design. So why do we need to establish the requirement? Actually, uh, the fact is that um, sometimes we have requirements in front of us as designer or project leader, sometimes it happens the requirements are not really clear. They are hidden somewhere and we need to really find them, we need to really extract them. So that's why we need to establish the requirements from uh, user's need. So there are four types of activities involved in establishing the requirements, but why we need to establish requirements? The activities involved, the first activity involved is requirement gathering or requirement capturing. It means that requirements are there, present, we just need to pick them up 
from that place. Then uh, the second activity is called requirement facilitation. What does it mean? It means that our client know the requirement, but we are going to meet them, we are going to talk to them, we are going to interview them in order to get their requirements from them. Okay? Then, uh, then we call the terminology of establishing the requirements. It means that we also going to analyze these requirements. It means that we are going to involve some kind of requirement uh, analysis activities. There are different kind of activities. We uh, analyze these initial set of the requirements, and then uh, we are going to uh, make them producible for some design part or uh, prioritize them and uh, do these kind of activities. And the last thing is that uh, requirement engineering. So uh, actually, requirement engineering is better term than other because it recognizes that developing a set of requirement is an iterative process of evolution, ne negotiation, and other that need to be carefully managed and controlled. So, means that uh, engineering means that if I will tell you you are the engineer, it means that you have knowledge of process of uh, building some system. So you are not going to just uh, have hazardly just take some system or build it, but you are going to apply some kind of thought process or available process in order to build this system. Similarly, in uh, requirement engineering, we are going to apply some kind of procedure in order to get the requirement, analyze them, and produce them for design part. So this is the requirement engineering thing. Okay. So now I will go to further slide. And uh, as you know, there are different kind of requirements. There are functional requirements. There are other non-functional requirements. If I talk about the functional requirements, these are these system functionality. For example, user will be able to log into the system by using its username and password and press the button. Similarly, there are some non-functional requirements. These are more subjective or more measurable requirements. These are the performance of, uh, of the system. These can be uh, usability. These can be security, response time. These are the quality factors. So these are things are kind of non-functional requirements. There are some more kind of requirements. The third kind is data requirements. What kind of data need to be stored? For example, we need customer uh, username, password, numerical data, alarm data. Uh, these all kind of data requirements are the uh, data requirements of the system. So when it comes to different kind of requirements, there are some more category of the requirements, and these kind of requirements are called the environmental requirements or context of use. Context means that uh, uh, that situation where the system is going to be used. For example, learning in teaching learning classroom is a context in. Uh, uh, in uh, playing games, uh, the ground is the context, and so the, these are the environmental or context uh, of use requirements. So it uh, definitely refers to the circumstances in which the interactive product will be operated. So there are different kind of uh, aspects of the environmental requirements. These kind of aspects, these aspects are first aspect is physical aspect that where the um, physical uh, environment of system use uh, so that uh, the system will be designed accordingly. For example, the place will be dusty, noisy, the, there should be a vibration, there should be a light, heat, or humidity. For example, if I take the example of ATM machine, ATM machines are usually in dusty and noisy environments, so we need to design the ATM machine accordingly so that user can effectively will be able to use this machine, okay, in uh, the that physical context. Similarly, if I talk about uh, uh, the uh, cashier system, uh, the physical context of the cashier system is that he is uh, he, it is present in the supermarket. Many customers are interacting with them, so he is uh, um, going to do his task in standing condition. So 
So these kind of uh, requirements are also part of physical requirement. If you are using some system inside the vehicle or car, there will be vibration involved. So you need to identify the appropriate way, way that how you will be able to come. The other factors affecting uh, during the usage of the system. Similarly, uh, the social environment are mostly related to, if we go to chapter number four, uh, there I have talked about the topic of co-presence or telepresence. So this is kind of social aspect. Uh, means that uh, if there is any calibration or coordination involved in usage of the system, and if this is involved, then how we are going to propose our system? So what are the social requirements of the system? There is uh, the third aspect that is called organizational environment. In the in organizational environment, that is that if we are going to develop some kind of system inside some organization, how good is user support likely to be? How easily can it be obtained? Uh, what are the other facility or resource of training? For example, if I talk about the King Faisal University, look at your lab. IT department is here in order to configure your lab. But if in some companies there is no IT department, how you are going to provide support in that context? Similarly, there are some kind of technical environment. It is more uh, uh, related to the compatibility of the technology. Uh, or some technological limitation, for example, if we are going to use something on Windows, if uh, it is also appropriate in Android or things like that, how the system is going to tackle different kind of screen sizes and things like that. Okay, so these are the different environmental requirements. And um, you know, besides the functional, non-functional data requirements, we need to also identify such environmental requirements. So uh, this is uh, the good example of uh, environmental requirements that deal with the uh, underwater computing. Uh, it is because the person is going to use it un underwater, so it is going to surround it by water. Uh, but uh, uh, there are a lot of other things we need to remember because if we are going to use this system, the system should be waterproof. For this, they have developed this system that is called the wet PC that is on the back of the person and the person uh, has some kind of glasses which is providing him with virtual displays, head of this, this um, uh, head, uh, virtual display on his eyes and how the person will be able to interact with the system with the help of control in his hand. It has uh, uh, five or six buttons that will give him opportunity to uh, operate his PC. Uh, and uh, this system is definitely developed on the environmental environment, uh, environmental requirements because uh, it is quite different kind of uh, situation. So uh, in this scenario, uh, there should be environmental uh, requirements should be clear so that uh, the system can be effectively use in different kind of uh, uh, situation. And this uh, uh, interactive uh, uh, thing is called chord pad that has five keys. Okay, so uh, that is really suitable for the person to uh, dive into the ocean and do his research on different kind of species or plants inside the water. So uh, first of all, in order to get the requirements, we need to understand that uh, what is the most important thing in order to get the right kind of requirements. So if uh, I talk about uh, the first thing, as I have already mentioned, these are called users. Because users are very important. Uh, Sector, you need to understand then that who are they, what are their characteristics, 
uh, whether they have uh, uh, educational background or they are illiterate or literate user, what are their nationality so that if we need to use different kind of languages in our system, we will be able to identify them. Uh, can they use computer or we need to provide them with very simple kind of interface so that they will not be reluctant in order to use the system. Uh, if they are uh, new voice expert or casual or frequent users, for example, our new voice user will require step-by-step -step instructions, probably with prompting and constraint interaction backup with clear information. Similarly, an expert will require flexible interaction with more wide range power of control. The collection of characteristics of typical user is called user profile. So you have seen that if uh, 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 there is some kind of system that will use frequent tasks like billing system, then shortcuts are more appropriate. But if there is uh, some system you are going to develop, uh, for example, uh, uh, using ATM machines or using some kind of vending machines, uh, then uh, it's good to provide uh, recognition versus uh, then require and then provide them menu with menu-based interaction. Okay, so you need to understand users and it's very important to understand them. Uh, and why uh, we need to understand the users? Definitely it is very uh, important because every human being is different from each other. Even look at the hand size. They have different hand size. So um, definitely if you will put uh, some buttons on different kind of positions, then uh, it is really challenging that how they are going to interact with that. Similarly, if we are talking about the uh, in, uh, uh, input output devices, some uh, users are slow, some users are fast, so that but, uh, how we are going to develop the user interface that will provide uh, them the response according to their motor abilities. Uh, if we are designing some kind of uh, cashier system, uh, look at the height of different kind of uh, um, cashiers. So how we are going to uh, design that will fit all Similarly, uh, there are some special kind of cases to design the user interfaces for the ch little children. For example, it, sh it is recommended, one of the recommended guidelines is that to design our uh, such system that will not uh, be challenging in operating, but it will be challenging in changing the batteries. Uh, what about the people with disabilities, how you will be incorporating accessibility in the system in the form of speech, in the form of vibration, in the form of gesture. So these are the few things we need to identify because, uh, of, uh, because of users we can develop the system. So it is very important to understand our users in proper way. So in order to understand our users in a proper way, we need to develop personas. What, uh, what are the personas? These uh, personas are developed in order to capture a set of users' characteristics. It looks like a user profile, but this is synthetic one. What does it mean? That, uh, synthetic, uh, synthetic, synthetic, synthetic means that you are doing the copy of the real thing. So they should not be uh, perfect uh, users, but they should have some kind of limitations in using the system. The persona will also bring uh, uh, the um, skills of the users, computer operating skills of the users, so that we will be able to understand the user in more better way. So otherwise it looks like a normal uh, user's profile. You see this is one of the example persona. She is Jenny. Uh, this is her background, her age and education. Uh, this is her motivation that she likes networking, she likes fashion, she likes friends. Uh, what are her frustrations? Because if some, uh, she has some kind of security issues, if some unknown person want to be friend with her in Facebook, she don't like it. What is her profile information that she pro uh, receives, uh, she's a student of math and English. And uh, um, she is physically active because she is a player of netball and she is good in art. And uh, um, uh, she can use laptop uh, because her daddy bought 
for her uh, and she do downloading music and uh, uh, social networking on the Facebook with friends. She can also chat using the uh, laptop. So this is her uh, skill. So you need to mention the persona's skill. And uh, later on, uh, uh, she has some other interests. So you will be able to develop persona about uh, users in your system in order to understand them well. So after developing her persona, why persona is important? Persona is important because we will be able to identify our system stakeholders, all kind of users who are going to use our system. First we will identify them, then we will be able to get their samples from the real population in order to gather the requirements. So there are various methods by using them we will be able to gather the requirements. One of the uh, method of uh, requirement gathering. You have already studied it already in many subjects. I will just repeat them. Uh, one of the method is interview. Interview is something one-to-one -one or face-to-face -face, uh, interaction between uh, the um, designer and uh, the client. Uh, these, uh, the um, the uh, designer or team lead uh, is sitting with the user and they ask some kind of questions and the user is going to answer these questions. This is good idea uh, to get the requirement from the user and exploring uh, the user views and issues. And um, uh, sometimes you can use low fidelity prototypes or some kind of props uh, in interview in order to clarify your requirements. The other way of getting the requirement is focus group. These are kind of uh, group interviews and if uh, it is a good idea if you are going to get uh, the concising view and highlighting area of conflict and disagreement during requir requirement acti uh, activity. Uh, you can conduct it in on the social level so that uh, um, uh, a stakeholder can meet the designer and each other and they will be able to express their view uh, to each other. Um, something about it that uh, how you will be able to uh, do focus group, you can conduct some kind of workshop. And these workshops uh, should be carefully planned and uh, attendees of the workshop should be carefully chosen and uh, specific deliverable should be produced so that it will be more fruitful to conduct these workshops so that it will be very useful uh, to get the requirements through these focus group workshop and uh, clarify different kind of uh, interest and conflicts in them, okay? Uh, but sometimes uh, if we select some specific kind of user, definitely it is dominated by some uh, user's point of view. Somehow that's a good idea to gather the requirements if you have accessibility of users. The other requirement gathering activity is called the questionnaire. You all are well aware of questionnaire. There are different kind of questionnaire and most of the time we use uh, these questionnaire uh, if you can get some initial response from the user whether they need some kind of uh, system, how much they need this kind of system, what is uh, um, uh, their view on particular issue and things like that. Um, so uh, the questionnaires uh, uh, can also be used with other requirement gathering activities. There are two types of questionnaire, quantitative and qualitative questionnaire. In quantitative questionnaire, we have some kind of yes, no, a Likert scale so that we will be able to just gather the measurable measures. But in qualitative questionnaire, the user is going to answer some specific kind of question so that they will be able to get some kind of uh, user's opinion on uh, different kind of uh, services. For example, questionnaire might be used to um, get whether a new university online health service is good welcome by the student. And this questionnaire could ask for impression, opinion, and support services, whether uh, the respondent is prepared to interview and further things like that, OK? And uh, so questionnaire is initially very useful way of conducting, uh, getting the requirements, okay? The next kind of uh, 
question uh, next kind of recombinant gathering activity is researching similar product and this is what I am going to uh, recommend you inside your projects. Uh, uh, definitely if you have some kind of available system you are just going to study them and read about their specification, understand them to get their good uh, uh, aspects and bad aspects and try to improve these systems. Direct observations are such kind of observation uh, where uh, you go to the participants working place or real setting and try to look, uh, understand the nature of their task and context in which they are performing the task and you are going to do observation that how they are carrying out the task and uh, uh, then you will be able to uh, uh, sometimes it uh, definitely uh, you need to go there and it really required you a lot of commitment. There are some indirect kind of observations. These kind of observations are usually uh, done through uh, some other way like information logging or diary study. What is the concept usually? What you do, you give your diary to, there is a diary like a notebook. You give it to the user and ask them time to time while they will use this system if they will feel some kind of uh, comment or suggestion they are going to write down in the diary. Mostly these indirect observation takes months or lot of time in order to gather the data. Okay. Uh, then if there is uh, some other kind of uh, uh, requirement gather method that is called studying the documentation. Usually every company, every organization has some specific kind of procedure, rule, document, uh, documents in the manual and they are written. Most of the time uh, what is uh, happening, uh, uh, even users don't know about the policies of the company, so it's a good idea that you will study their policy that how some work is going on. For example, if you have to withdraw a uh, subject or withdraw a um, semester from the university, what is the real procedure? It should be written inside the university documentation so that uh, if there is some, uh, you want to automate this process, uh, you are going to uh, just read the documentation and see what are the real regulations, then you will be able to interview the administration and uh, students to get their requirements and automate it. Uh, and this is also uh, good for understanding the leg leg legislation and uh, background information. Uh, somehow, uh, uh, definitely you are not wasting a lot of uh, user's time, but it is good to use it with other uh, requirement gathering activity. There is uh, one more requirement get uh, gathering activity that is called the contextual inquiry. Uh, and um, it is one of uh, the part of contextual design and it is the structure approach to collection and uh, interpretation of data from fieldwork with intention of building software based products. The idea about contextual inquiry is that you are not going to uh, do it in your lab or something but you are going to go to the real context of use. And uh, uh, here you will work with the user in the real scenario. Um, a user will be regarded as expert and designer will be regarded as the learning uh, le learner. User will do their task and uh, the designer will observe the user. And uh, they will, uh, time to a time, they will be able to ask the users that how they are performing this task and what they think about this task. In this way, they will be able to gather the requirements on the real context of use. Uh, one of the example is that contextual inquiry was used for six weeks to investigate that how car driver interacts with multi-function rotating button. Uh, that is usually found in the center of the car dashboard and uh, in this study they uh, uh, find out about the comfort, safety, security factor uh, of this button and um, they were also trying to uh, uh, use the factors of visual and haptic um, aesthetic uh, by any participants. So, so uh, actually uh, after doing this study, uh, 
in the real car, in the real driving scenario, they will be able to find that uh, how the new in vehicle information system look like and nowadays we have seen that a lot of car navigation and information systems are part of the car. The, uh, so um, usually they take a lot of time in order to do, uh, in the real world space uh, to get the user requirement and then later on they will be able to uh, sit down with the user in order to identify their uh, doubts on the finding. So there are four types of uh, uh, main principle involved in the contextual uh, inquiry. One thing is the context that uh, the study should be done on the real workplace in order to see what happened. Partnership. Uh, this is also covering the interpretation uh, principle that um, uh, the interpretation should uh, sorry, partnership is uh, something that uh, uh, the user and uh, the uh, designer will sit down together and they will be able to collaborate together in order to find, uh, in order to dig down the findings. Uh, then they will be able to make the interpretation of the observation and they can sit down together and user will be, designer will be able to ask the user what does it mean, what the finding means. And uh, the last thing is that uh, focus, that uh, if you go to some context and you are trying to find, uh, dig down some findings on that uh, context, so just focus on that. Do not try to uh, distract you uh, from your real work and try to focus on other tasks, okay? So this, these are the rules of contextual inquiry. So what are the data gathering guidelines we have found after a uh, whole of this story? Uh, first of all, uh, the first thing, what I have already told you, that you need to identify all the users of the system, all the stakeholders. So uh, you need to identify if they are users, manager, developer, everyone you need to identify. And then uh, once you have already identified all kind of users, you need to get samples from all the users. Do not leave any stakeholder group. So that you will be able to get complete set of the recommend. For example, if you want to develop some thing, some system for a student learning system, but if you will just uh, interview university president or HOD, this is not a complete set of stakeholders. You need to involve on the student group, administration, administrator, staff group, faculty group, uh, HODs group, so that you will be able to have complete set of the requirements. Um, users should be the real users, not their managers. Um, sometimes uh, it can happen that uh, uh, if we are trying to uh, uh, get only uh, managers, they can use uh, uh, to build the system just for their critical uh, benefits. So avoid them and involve all kind of users. Do not try to dominate certain stakeholders, but try to involve all kind of stakeholders. Sometimes it happens that uh, the country situation changes, the uh, organization situation changes, so you need to also incorporate all these kind of changes while collecting the data. Um, uh, and also, uh, you need to get complete functional and non-functional requirements. It is not recommended just to focus on the functional requirements or just to focus on non-functional requirements, but try to get all different kind of requirements. And uh, um, uh, usually in requirement gathering activity, uh, requirement management play a very good role. Usually you have different kind of software systems. You can use these sort software systems in order to record uh, the different kind of requir requirements according to their version and who has gathered the requirements. And in the next iteration, iteration if the requirement changes, then you will be able to at least maintain different kind of version numbers. Um, 
in order to gather the requirements, uh, uh, the communication is also play a very strong role. Um, uh, it means that uh, you need to um, uh, not only communicate with the customer, but you need to also um, uh, transfer these requirements within the development team. Uh, and uh, uh, the one more thing is that um, uh, that is called domain knowledge. So you need to understand the domain knowledge. Sometimes we, if we are developing some kind of software system, they have uh, uh, for different kind of domains. For example, if we are developing for medical sciences, they have their own uh, jargons or term terminology. Most of the time, we are not aware of these terminologies. So we need to understand the domain knowledge and so that we will be able to dig down and understand it, and then we will be able to develop the effective system for such a domain. Uh, other thing is that uh, in requirement gathering activity, we need to involve all the key people. Um, uh, this is good idea that you will not only do interviews or focus group just, but combine uh, most many uh, requirement gathering activities so that you will be able to get maximum requirements and the real requirements from the users. And you can uh, definitely use some uh, suitable props. Prototype, task description, uh, you know, uh, requirement gathering activities so that the user will be able to understand well and give you the complete set of the requirements. The next uh, part is uh, how we are going to interpret and analyze the data. This is just like uh, in uh, requirement analysis phase. In many other uh, courses, we do it with the use case analysis here. I, I will tell you more in detail that uh, what are the strategies we will be able to use in order to interpret the data and uh, analyze the data. That, in, for example, in software engineering, we have use cases. Then we have uh, different design approaches like class diagram, ER diagram. But here we will uh, definitely use the use case diagram or scenarios in order to analyze the requirements. So uh, in a requirement analysis phase, there are some kind of task uh, descriptions involved that uh, have uh, been already used during for the software, uh, uh, software system development. Now um, uh, these uh, task descriptions descriptions can be done by using uh, three different techniques, scenarios, use cases, and essential use cases. So um, what are these scenarios? Scenarios are definitely the story of uh, simple system use. Uh, and use cases uh, is uh, inter uh, usually uh, showing the interaction of the users with the uh, system how they are going to perform, what kind of tasks they are going to perform on the system. Essential use case overcome the limitation of the scenario and use cases, and they are a little bit abstract uh, presentation of system usage from the users. So it also involves the intention of the users. So if I go further, um, I will talk about the scenario. As I have already told you, a scenario is formal narrative description uh, in the form of a story that allow exploration and discussion of context, needs, requirements. Uh, it, sometimes it's not necessary. It will describe the use of software or other technology, but uh, definitely it's, uh, 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 it depends on the scenario type. Sometimes it uh, defines the need, or sometimes it defines the usage of the system, but not very uh, specific usage of the system. So this is the example scenario of travel organizer. Uh, Thompson family enjoy outdoor activities, but to try their hands-on uh, sailing experience this year. There are four family members. Now they uh, show different kind of persona, Sky, and one, Claire, and Will. And uh, one evening after dinner, they decide to start exploring possibility. They will gather around the travel organizer, enter their initial set of requirements. Now they are uh, giving us visualization that they have some kind of system, and they are giving their requirements. A sailing trip for four novices in Mediterranean. 
the console is designed so the interface is console based uh, that all member of family can interact easily and comfortably with it. It means that this allows the group activity. The system's initial suggestion is Flotilla where several group uh, sail together on separate boats. Sky and Edmund was aren't very happy at the idea of going on vacation with group of other people. Even though the Thompson would have their own boat, the travel organizer shows them description of flotillas from other children of their ages and they are very positive. So eventually everyone agrees to explore, explore flotilla opportunity, will confirm this recommendation and ask for detail option. It's getting great. He asked for the day to be saved so everyone can consider them together. So they have entered these uh, uh, information, they got some answers and now they are saving it to their system. So this is like system usage explanation. The travel organizer emailed them a summary of different options. So this is another functionality we have identified in this scenario. So this is uh, one example of the scenario where personas are doing some activity and we are looking different aspects on that. How scenario persona and goals are uh, connected together? Usually persona is a user uh, who is a player or actor of the scenario. Scenario is uh, uh, defined when, where and how the story of persona takes place and uh, it is in the form of a story that how persona behave in order to achieve his goal uh, and uh, what is goal, uh, goal uh, defines what the persona wants and their need. The goal is the motivation of the persona that uh, they will act in order to achieve their task. So this is goal they want to achieve from the system. So uh, the, these are the use cases of the travel organizer uh, in order to get visa information. So if we go in detail that system should display the option on, of investigation, uh, investigating visa and vaccination requirements. The user chooses the option to fill out uh, about visa requirements. The system prompts user the name of the destination country. You can maybe imagine that how it's going on. The, then the user will enter the country name. If the spelling of the country is valid, the system will ask uh, about the user's nationality. The user will enter his nationality. And if the nationality spelling is good, then the system checks the visa requirement of that country with respect to the destination country. And then uh, the system will show the visa requirement. Uh, and then, they, then the system will show that in what format they want to get the visa requirement printed, then uh, user will choose the printed format. So there is some kind of... Um, Alternative cases, you know when we do the use case analysis, we are, have some normal sequence and alternative sequence. So these are the alternative, alternative uh, courses of the tra travel organizer. If the country name is valid, the system uh, is invalid, then system display an error message and system return to step three. What is step three? The system will ask user for destination country. Then other is uh, eight number, if nationality is invalid, the system display an error message and system will return to step six. That is the system asks user for her nationality again. And if the information about uh, the visa requirement is found, the system display a suitable message. Um, and then go to back to step number one, again start asking for visa information. Okay, so this is the uh, alternative flow of travel organizer. <coughs> this is use case diagram. I am sure that you know that how to draw a use case diagram. This box is a system. These are the use cases. Travel, uh, travel is one of the users. He can identify the potential vacations. He can retrieve the visa requirements. He can also retrieve the vaccination requirements from the system. What travel agent can do with the system, he can, um, according to the travel requirement, he can update the travel details inside the system. So this is the detail of the travel organizer. So there is an other thing that is called the essential use cases. What are the essential use cases? Uh, they are also user cases 
or they are also called VTAS cases. They are more uh, simplified and abstract generalized use case than our scenarios. Uh, actually, there are use cases are limited, limited in some aspects, scenarios are limited in other aspects in order to overcome their limitations. The essential use cases are uh, described. Um, uh, the, uh, scenarios are, uh, what are the limitations? They are concrete story uh, that concentrate on realistic and specific activities. So they are a kind of story. And use cases are just uh, limited to the, uh, with the functionality, with the system, but essential use case capture the, uh, it is also capturing that what user wants with the technology and how we can implement it in the proper manner. So essential use cases uh, uh, try to complete uh, uh, what is missing in the uh, uh, scenarios and use cases. Uh, in the form of uh, the meaningful and well designed from a uh, point of view of the user uh, as they play on the uh, system. And definitely system uh, response is also recorded in the essential use cases. So uh, if we try to make the essential use cases, uh, it's narrated, it consists of three parts. The user intention, the step description of user actions, step description of the system responsibility. The example is there. What is the user intention to retrieve visa? So uh, what are the step description of the user? User will try to find visa requirements. System will request destination and functionality. System, uh, the user will supply required information. Then user will process it and obtain appropriate visa information. User will try to obtain the copy of visa information, so system will offer different kind of formats to the user in what format you want to take the copy, and the user will be able to choose the suitable format, and then the system will provide them in appropriate format, okay? So these are the some example of the uh, travel organizer. You know, uh, I, I'm just running out of the time, and I have just seven minutes, so I am going to uh, explain you the task analysis. That is very important topic. There was something which I have already explained you, task description, and they, uh, if you are going to develop a new system, so it helps you to envision a new system in the form of scenario, okay, use cases, and essential use cases. But if you have already developed system and you want to overcome its limitation, then task analysis is recommended because um, it is going to investigate the existing situation. Uh, um, uh, so uh, the real system is in front of users, so it is usually focused on that what uh, users are trying to achieve from the system, why they are trying to achieve uh, from the system, and uh, what are their steps or action uh, that why how they are going to achieve uh, what they want to achieve from the system. So usually the technique used in the task analysis is hierarchical task analysis. For example, you can just imagine it hierarchical means that we have parent, then child, grandchild. So hierarchical task analysis work in the same manner. It has task, subtask, sub to subtask. Um, in hierarchical task analysis, uh, we break down the task into subtask or sub to subtask, and then we are trying to group. The, then inside the plans. Um, so there are two things in there, the task and their subtask and the plans. These are two things involved in hierarchical task analysis. Uh, most of the time, uh, we are not going to focus on internal processing of the system, but we are just focusing on the task of the user, which are visible to us, OK? Um, uh, so most of the time in hierarchical task analysis, we start with the user goal, what user want to achieve from the system. For example, if you are listening to my lecture now, what you want to achieve, you want to really uh, attend uh, the B10 lecture. So this is your goal. And how you are going to achieve it, you can just uh, imagine what are the tasks you have done so far. So uh, we are going to identify those tasks which will make it possible to achieve our goal. So tasks are divided into subtasks and sub to subtasks. So this is one of the examples. You see this is home alone DVD. And user want to find uh, the, uh, try to 
by the DVB. This is Amazon.com. Uh, so they want to buy a home alone DVD. In order to buy a home alone DVD, this is our goal. Level zero is our goal. So this goal can be achieved by dividing this goal into sub tasks uh, and sub to sub tasks. So first uh, task is to locate the DVD, add DVD to shopping basket, enter payment detail, complete the address, confirm the order. So these are the main tasks which we can perform in order to buy the DVD. But this these tasks can also be further divided into sub tasks. Okay. And what are the plans? If you are a regular user, like you have already account inside the Amazon, then you will go uh, locate DVD, add to shopping cart, and confirm the order. But if you are a new user, then what you are going to do? You are going to uh, apply all these five uh, tasks because you are going to order it for the first time. Uh, so this is called the textual hierarchical task analysis. Now I will go to the next slide and I will give you the graphical or diagrammatic hierarchical task analysis. Here you have uh, to buy DVD. You will locate it by searching or browsing. You will add it to shopping basket. You will add the payment details, complete the address and confirm the order. Okay. So these are the, if you are a regular user, you have already account in Amazon, you will locate it, add to the shopping cart, confirm the order. If this is a plan zero for a regular user or if there is a user new then uh, they will be able to perform all these five steps okay so this is the first example of the hierarchical task analysis i will also give you the second example of hierarchical task analysis because i want to show you that how you will be able to improve the task analysis this is just simple explanation of that okay i need a tea you need to make a cup of tea for me so there are different kind of steps you can propose in order to make a cup of tea. Boil the water, empty the pot, pour tea deep into the pot, pour boiling water, wait for 5 minutes, pour tea. Uh, even these tasks can be further subdivided into uh, other tasks. For example, in order to boil the water, you know that you have to put the water, press the button and then boil it. So um, if I talk about plans can be written on the top of each uh, level. Uh, uh, for example, plan zero is do one, boil water. At the same time, if the pot is full, um, if it is empty, then you, uh, if it is full, then you can do three and four. You can put the leaves in the pot, pour the boiling water, and wait for five minutes and make the tea. So this is the initial set of the uh, yeah, hierarchical task analysis. Okay, you can be able to refine it. How you will be able to refine it? There is some easy way of refining it. Um, there is some kind of heuristic you can apply in order to improve it. First of all, look at the pair action. The pair action is look turn off the gas, but there is no turn on the gas. So you can put turn on the gas like that. Uh, turn off the gas, turn on the gas. Uh, similarly, you need to identify, reconstructure the thing that um, uh, you can regenerate some tasks because there are some tasks which are not really important but they are on the top. But make a pot is important task, but this is on the not on the top. There is no make a pot top uh, uh, task, so you will be able to make a pot as a top order task because uh, this is, uh, and you what you can do, you will be able to. Uh, uh, generate the task uh, within that. For example, put leaves, pour boiling water are the part of make, of, uh, make the pot. You need to also see that which tasks are important left and which tasks are not important left so that you will be able to uh, balance these tasks and then you will be able to generalize um, it. For example, if you are going to make one cup or many cups, how you will be able to uh, make it gen general. So uh, you will be able to generalize it uh, in the form of a loop. Okay. So this is how you will be able to refine hierarchical task analysis for making our T. Uh, these are the heuristics, pair, restructure, balance, and generalize it uh, by looking at that. And then similarly, uh, if I talk about here, so this is the important. Uh, 
this is the important uh, um, part that uh, uh, this was the initial task analysis and then while you apply the heuristic you will be able to improve it. Uh, you will be able to introduce a new task, make a pod, and put some other ta main task under this task. Similarly, you will be able to see that port E uh, can be generalized in the way that uh, uh, maybe there are more than one cup, so that uh, until unless the pot is um, empty, you will be able to make uh, make cup of tea, for example. Uh, uh, you will be able to put the milk in the cup, fill the cup with tea, and put the sugar. So these are the few things you will be able to know by generalizing. Okay. And uh, one more thing is uh, types of plants. There are different types of plants uh, because I have already told you there are tasks and subtasks involved in the hierarchical task analysis, and there are plans involved in the hierarchical task analysis. So there are different types of plans. One type of plan is fixed sequence and a plan that you have to perform one, two, and three. For example, you have to first uh, select the DVD, then add to the count, and then check out. So there are some kind of optional tasks. Uh, for example, um, if pot is full, then you will make it. Otherwise, if pot is empty, then you will be able to refill it. Okay. Uh, similarly, uh, wait for an event when. Um, Uh, waiting for an event is then in plan number one we have to wait uh, for a kettle to boil and in plan number zero uh, we have to wait for five minutes. Uh, later uh, we will be able to do it. For example, we have to wait. So waiting is also involved. Uh, in plan number zero we have to wait. Okay. Uh, similarly, cycles, uh, you will be able to make a loop or cycle until unless pot is empty. In plan 5, we have this kind of cycle thing. Uh, then time sharing. Time sharing in task 1 and 2 could be done at the same time. For example, one boil water and you can empty the pot. Okay? They can be done at the same time. Uh, this creationary, do any of three, part one, two, three in any order. Like if uh, we will put the leaves first or warm the pot first or pour the boiling water, it will not make any difference. You can uh, do it accordingly, okay? And uh, you can also have uh, the mixture uh, type of plan that uh, one plan can involve several plans. For example, plan zero. In DVD example plans, you know, will, if you are new user, you can perform 1 to 5. If you are old user, you can perform 1 to 5, things like that. So you can make the mixture of different kind of plans in one plan. So uh, this is all about the radical task analysis. What I have told you over there that I have told you that you can perform the task analysis. And then uh, uh, you will be able to define, uh, divide the task into subtasks, and later on you will be able to make their plan. You can first uh, improve your overall hierarchical task analysis by applying some kind of heuristic, and then also there are different kind of plans, so you will be able to define them accordingly. Okay. So if you have any other question, I can just answer you in the live session. Uh, so I have talked about the requirements, analysis of uh, requirement gathering, analysis of requirements, uh, task descriptions, and task analysis. And these are these course items. There are two types of activity you have to perform with this uh, uh, with this lectures, and I will explain you later. I will upload it to you. Thank you so much for listening. Bye bye.